Hi, before we can get to computing the actual p-values, we have to consider what we're going to do with our voxels. So today I'm going to focus on clusters, peaks, and voxels. First, uh, make sure you're ready for this. You should be feeling pretty good about your hypothesis testing background. If not, go back to this video and check it out. It was just the last video in the series prior to this. And a lot of these slides are from Tom Nichols, with permission. Uh, right, so hypothesis testing on fMRI. So we, we've been all along uh, using this mass univariate modeling approach. So every time I've, I've presented anything I'm modeling, I'd say, well, just we're just doing this for a single box a little time. So you can ignore the fact that our data are actually in an image. Um, specifically, uh, sometimes, not, uh, sometimes it's referred to as a bag of voxels. You just treat your data as a bag of voxels and go through and analyze each one separately. But they're not a, a bag of voxels. Uh, we actually have an image, and images have other properties. So when we're going to threshold our images, we have to think about things like bag of voxels versus the fact that we're working with um, an actual image. So anyway... We fit our separate model at each voxel. We have a t statistic for each voxel, and now we would like to compute some sort of a p-value and threshold our map. So one question is, which threshold actually shows us signals? So on the left here, we have a really high threshold, so we have just these few little regions of activation here. In this case, with a really high threshold, you have good specificity. Um, it's pretty focused, probably, where the activation really was. And the side effect of that is you have poor power. There are a lot of voxels or regions of the brain that you're missing. On the other end of the spectrum, with the low threshold, we have really poor specificity because now just about the entire brain is lit up. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't use that terminology, but active. And our risk of false positives is now really high, but we have really good power. If something truly is active, we've probably found it. It's just mixed in with a lot of false positives. So somewhere in the middle is where we'd like to be, where we have this balance between power and false positive rates. But the focus here is in controlling the false positive rate, which becomes really difficult when you have uh, 200,000 tests. How do we control the false positive rate for that? So as I said, we have to figure out how we're going to treat the data, and there are different levels of inference. We can focus on the individual voxels. Um, we could also use cluster level inference. I'll explain what clusters are. There's also peak level, level inference and set level inference. Starting with the voxel level inference. This just does intuitively probably what you think about doing with your image. So what I'm showing here um, just for illustrative purposes, this is just a line of voxels, okay, over space. So just one row and one slice, and I'm plotting the t statistics here. And you might wonder, well, why are they continuous? Just pretend I have really small voxels. Okay, so these are the statistics values that we would view in a map, typically. Now, what we can do is just apply a threshold to this u alpha. So that's the tricky part. We have to figure out what this threshold is. And if your voxels have statistics above the threshold, they are deemed active. So this patch of voxels right here with these large statistics above the threshold are considered active. And over here where we have this kind of more widespread cluster but with lower activation, no significance would be found because the threshold wasn't um, low enough to capture those voxels. So the benefit of a voxel level inference is that it gives you the best spatial, spatial specificity. Uh, you can actually say something about a single voxel. You can accept or reject the null for that uh, single voxel. Sorry, I, I fail to reject or reject. Okay, cluster level inference instead uses a two-step process. So this is what you most likely have used if you've analyzed fMRI data. And I think sometimes people are confused depending on the, the software, They're like why are there two thresholds? Well, here is, this is why. The first threshold is just defining clusters. So the idea here is that no single voxel really 
you know, how much faith do you have that that voxel is exactly where the activation is? Instead, we're interested in the clusters as a whole. So the first threshold is just defining the cluster. So I have two clusters, this one here and this cluster here. The next step is to come up with a cluster specific statistic. So we're abandoning, we're, we're not done with, but it's usually based off of the actual voxel wise statistic, but it's a statistic for the cluster. Uh, so one example of that could just be cluster size. So this cluster is really big. This cluster is really small. Um, we come up with some distribution for cluster size and using that distribution, we can find a threshold K alpha that controls the false positive rate at alpha and a cluster would have to be larger than K alpha, which is indicated by this error to be deemed significant. So this little one isn't, this big one is. So that's another example of cluster level inference. I don't think I have it here in the slides. Another example is cluster mass, which is basically um, takes into account the extent and the, the magnitude of the activation. And um, it's just a different thing. It turns out the statistics behind that are much more complicated. So that isn't uh, implemented in most standard uh, fMRI analysis software packages. You can do it with permutation based methods. And I will talk about those later. Anyway, getting ahead of myself. Right, so here we typically have better sensitivity than we do with the voxelized inference. Um, but we have worse spatial specificity because when you have a cluster statistic, you're accepting or rejecting the entire cluster. So it's like an omnibus test. Only thing we can conclude is that one or more voxels within that cluster uh, are active. Peak level inference is similar um, to cluster level inference in that you have two thresholds. So you start with a type of cluster forming threshold. So here I have threshold that's a slightly different image, but we have these, um, I need more peaks in it. So then you identify the peaks. So they're basically these local maxima. And then once you have the peaks, you find a statistic for the peak size. And then you come up with a peak threshold. So the second threshold is based on some distributional properties about the peak. So in this case, only Z2 and Z4 would be significant. Z1, Z3, and Z5 would not be significant. Okay, so that is peak level inference. It's very similar to cluster level inference. Um, the significance only applies to a set of voxels, the peak and its neighbors. Okay, so most of the focus and the rest of the talks that follow will be on voxel level and cluster level since I think these are the most common. If I'm wrong, let me know. Um, uh, there's a little bit more with peak level, I think, recently. I'd be happy to talk about that. Set level, which I put in there and skipped, that would just be testing the whole brain at once. So basically, is there any activation in my brain anywhere? So basically the whole brain would be one big cluster. So of course that has the worst spatial specificity because you would just uh, say yes or no. There's activation somewhere in the brain, but you don't know where. So make sure you have all that, um, especially this business with the two thresholds. Make sure you have a firm handle on that and make sure you understand what that statistic is with the cluster level inference, for example. Uh, what is the statistic we actually end up thresholding? And have a look at your software. What thresholding strategy do you typically use? So I'm not talking about do you use FDR, random field theory, you know, whatever. All of those approaches have both voxel-wise and cluster-wise and sometimes peak-wise uh, strategies. So um, that's not enough. You have to understand if it's voxel-wise or cluster-wise. And then on top of that, you have to understand what I'll talk about next time or over the next... Um, few times the, uh, the way you're actually estimating your statistics for that. All right, thanks a bunch. Please join the Facebook group and have a great day.